Welcome to the Deep Light Podcast from Park City's Presbyterian Church. This is a space for community, healing, hope, and education around topics of rescue and growth. Our prayer for this series is that it illuminates a deeper understanding of struggles within and around us, as well as God's profound love and redemptive light in Jesus Christ. Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Deep Light. It's a ministry of Park City's Presbyterian Church, and I'm very, very thankful that you come along with us. Uh, today, we're blessed to have with us Dr. Christina Savagian. I want to welcome you. She, go Thank ahead. you, Mark. Oh, you're Thanks. welcome. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, and she serves at Sparrow House, which is a wonderful counseling center here in Dallas. We're going to be talking about trauma, and um, in the last few weeks, you know, there's been a lot of trauma in our church and certainly beyond, and one of our close church families in Nashville. It's April 21st of 2023, so if you're watching this, you kind of have some sense of the cultural context. But we're gonna talk about trauma, what it is, and how do we deal with it personally, but also how do we help others who are in it. Each time you watch this or listen, we always want you to know that if there's any issue you're struggling with, we would love to come and walk alongside you. You can email us at deeplight at pcpc.org, you can also call our offices at 214-224-2500. Those notes will be in the show notes. So um, if you see those, please don't hesitate to reach out. One of the worst things that can happen is we try to deal with stuff alone, and we don't want you to. So anyway, thanks for coming along. Well, Christine, I'm really grateful that you would take time to spend with us. When things happened recently in Nashville, the shooting mm-hmm. that took place there, Chad Scruggs, uh, who is the pastor there and the father of Hallie, who was one of the the three children killed, and then one of the six who were killed. Um, Very close friend, served here at this church for five years, was on campus here longer than that, um, serving at SMU. So we've known him a long time, he and his wife Jada and all their children. Um, We had a service here just to pray, and I know that you and some of your colleagues offered to be here for parents and others after that, just to help them as they walked through us. So I am personally so grateful for your willingness to jump in and help us. And I thought today what we could do is just start by talking about trauma in general. Mm-hmm. People use that term a lot, and they might not really even know what it means and how many different layers of trauma there are. So can we start there? Sure. Just Could you give us like a working definition of trauma? Yeah, so I think there, trauma is sort of a loose term mm-hmm. in general. So what we kind of talk about from a psychological standpoint a lot of times is post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Mm -hmm. So we have a specific in the psychological world criteria for what that means. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times people are in different situations that feel traumatic to them. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. So, you know, I work with kids and adolescents and parents, and I had, you know, just a student recently who every time she had to write a paper, so that happens a lot at school, Mm -hmm. um, she'd have these traumatic reactions, meaning just kind of getting getting overwhelmed with anxiety, Mm -hmm. heart beating fast, sweating, just any time at school there's a writing prompt. Wow, so a real real physical manifestation of something going on inside her that was creating it. So for her, that felt like trauma. That felt like trauma. And when she helped me understand the connection, the connection was during COVID, that's when the writing at school really ramped up. Mm -hmm. So she associated it with some of the feelings that she had during COVID. And so the the actual writing assignment was just a trigger for that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when something traumatic happens, like unfortunately the shooting in Nashville, you know, even walking by that church, Mm -hmm. people could have a reaction of just that sweating, heart beating fast, Mm -hmm. just feeling just overwhelmed with emotion. So Mm -hmm. um, anyways, that's, that's part of that definition of trauma. So there's that clinical definition. And then there's what kind of how people have these different experiences. And we might say, oh, that was traumatic, meaning it was very difficult. They have a mm-hmm. lot of emotions about it. Maybe they've been dealt with. Maybe they haven't been dealt with Yeah. Yet. So what would some of those things be? Like if, if somebody was trying to understand the difference between truly what would be diagnosed as trauma, trauma. post-traumatic stress, whatever, disorder, versus, yeah, that was hard. That was mm-hmm. difficult. What would be some things that would be like in those different. categories? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's usually the amount of impact or impairment. Okay. So, you know, if a person, this is, you know, post six weeks after something happening, mm-hmm. you know, if they're going, I can't sleep, I'm having nightmares, um, I feel very jumpy, like mm-hmm. if there's loud noises, I'm not managing that very well, I feel very anxious all the time, 
those are some of those symptoms. And then in our world, for the PTSD diagnosis, the trauma has to have happened to them or they have to have seen it. So it's not um, like maybe I'm in, in Dallas and I, I didn't know the Scruggs family. Mm-hmm. And so I can say, wow, that's really awful and sad, but that's not a trauma to mm-hmm. me personally, if that yeah. makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. That's helpful, actually helpful. I knew um, the whole idea of how it manifests itself. I want to start there for a minute. When I was, uh, we had been, you know, fairly newly married, maybe three years. My wife and I traveled out to California where my sister mm-hmm. lived. It was 1994, January, and there was an earthquake. And it was, wow. at that time, the most expensive natural disaster in the history of our country. It was mm-hmm. a 6.6 earthquake, maybe 6.7. Um, it was incredible. And she was in the epicenter. You know, she lost wow. her house through that. I mean, it was just tremendous destruction. And we were there. My mom was there with us. Um, we'd driven all the way from Oklahoma City. And I don't remember how many aftershocks took place after that, mm. but hundreds. And we stayed for six days, put my mom on a plane, she flew back, we stayed for six days, and then drove back to Oklahoma City. When we got back, my wife and I began to experience these things that were really interesting. For example, felt very unsafe mm-hmm. in the house. We didn't mm-hmm. live in a great neighborhood, so we wanted an alarm system. Mm-hmm. Or I even thought about you know getting mm-hmm. a, a weapon to protect us, mm-hmm. which had nothing to do necessarily with the earthquake, but there was a manifestation of this Fear. It happened in the middle of the night, 4.30 in the morning. So anytime we would wake up, yes. to something, there was this trauma. And Mark, I'm so glad you brought that up because one of the results of being through trauma is having this hypervigilance. So always scanning your environment for danger and being on the lookout and then wanting to do things like, oh, do I have a home alarm system? Yeah. Or maybe I want to carry a gun and I've never wanted to carry a gun before. So you, things like that. You use that phrase, hypervigilance. Yes. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's a clinical word, but it just basically means I'm kind of always on alert and scanning the environment for danger. Yeah. Which then what can happen um, for people is then they have a hard time focusing in other arenas. So like at work, their job, they might feel really distracted because they're constantly scanning the environment for danger. And kids do the same thing in schools. They might not be able to pay attention and listen to their teacher because they're always looking for danger. And because it's not necessarily connected to the same event, like I really, coming back to Oklahoma City, I was not afraid of an earthquake in Oklahoma City, but I did have that vigilance. I really was so Mm -hmm. hyper-protective of my wife and of the environment. And I never made the connection Mm -hmm. until a little bit later and I was like, that was a pretty traumatic thing that we went through. Absolutely. The things that we saw, you know, yes. the suffering that was present. So that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. So when someone is kind of living in that that pattern, reacting, there's things beginning to manifest. What is kind of the common human nature to deal with it? You know, what do you see? In People terms of, try to do. Yeah. What are they trying to do to to make it to cope through that? They a lot of times want to control. So they want to control their environment. So maybe they don't want the music to be so loud or they want it to be the perfect temperature or what have you in their environment. Or they may want to control people. So they maybe get really controlling. Like a parent might be like, okay, well, you can't go here unless I have you on Life 360 and then you have to call me every 10 minutes and let me know where you are, right? Mm -hmm. Because maybe I've been through this really awful thing. Mm -hmm. So control, because anytime that anxiety and panic and fear comes up, that's just really as we all know, human nature to just want to try to control. Well, let's talk about that then in like a family system or even just in friendships. Mm-hmm. If a, if one person goes through it, um, through something that they would mm-hmm. say is traumatic, and um, they're having manifestations of that, or if, the, if everybody did, people might deal with it in different ways. Yes, they, right? people cope differently. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really important point because, you know, for example, in um, children that have gone through cancer treatment, mm-hmm. the divorce rate is about 50%. Mm-hmm. And it's so high because parents have to cope with something really hard, something life-threatening. They life-threatening probably do it differently from their spouse. Right. So maybe one person doesn't want to talk about it at all. They want to avoid it. They want to just go and do other things that make them feel better, make them happier. Mm-hmm. Somebody else really needs to talk about it. They want to process it. They want to do that with their spouse. Mm -hmm. And so you can see those styles of coping are really, really different. And a lot of times um, they can kind of push people away from each other instead of helping them come together. It's interesting. uh, This Deep Light podcast we're doing right now uh, is being recorded on the heels of one series we just finished, which was on grief. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that came up in almost every episode was that people grieve differently. differently. Mm -hmm. And particularly if there is a an untimely death or mm-hmm. something that's very difficult or 
hard to explain, especially with parents. You know, you do see those kind of divorce rates okay. being extremely high. Um, so I guess it makes sense that that would be the case with trauma. Mm -hmm. S sticking with the idea of kind of family units, um, let's talk about parents who have a child yeah. that's going through something traumatic. Mm -hmm. And obviously the world that our children are growing up in is so different in so many ways. Yes. And there's, obviously there's some common things that are the same, but this whole thing with shootings and yes. how do you see that impacting children and how can parents really help their kids mm -hmm. if they're you know really living in a place where they're you know manifesting a lot of fear and mm -hmm. things like that that's such a good question so my i was talking to my niece she's mm -hmm. a junior in high school and she said okay christina you went to a big public high school she goes to a big public high school mm -hmm. How did you feel about the active shooter drills? What was it like for you? Because in, at my high school, if a trash can falls over, we kind of all have this response. Wow. Because they practice those active shooter drills because in our time period, yeah, we have, have to. to. That's a reality, right? And so, you know, unfortunately, I was like, hey, Lily, I actually went to high school and graduated in 1999. The first school shooting, Columbine, yeah. happened that year. And so you guys are living in a really different reality than I was in. And she goes, well, that doesn't help me very much, <laughs> which is fair. Yeah, That's very fair. Yeah. Fair point. And I but said, it's true. It's true. And I said, I know it. I know it. And um, I, I think one of the things parents have to do is kids do feel anxious about that. And they do have to practice these drills. And I mean, at our preschool, they practice this drill. They don't tell them what it is, but right. they practice this drill and they let us know. And so that does instill in children there's a little bit of fear in this place that's supposed to be safe. Schools, traditionally, we wanted schools and churches to feel really safe. safe. Yeah. And unfortunately, in our time period, I think neither feel completely safe because there's also been shootings at churches. Right. So really this attack of these places in our communities that should feel really good. Mm. And so as a parent, I think you do have to validate, I understand mm -hmm. why you feel this way. I understand that this feels a little scary. So the first step is really for them to validate their child's emotion. Mm -hmm. Sometimes for a parent that can be kind of scary mm -hmm. because they go, oh, isn't that saying it's right? And isn't that going to make them feel worse? Mm -hmm. And it's, no, you're validating the emotion. So what are some ways they can validate that emotion? Things that they can say and then maybe things they shouldn't say. Yeah. I can understand why you feel that way. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of bad things, terrible things that have happened at schools. I can understand that. Mm -hmm. um, understanding is a good word because some some teenagers in particular, if you say, well, I know what that's like, they would go, well, you didn't grow up. Yeah. Like I said yeah. to my niece, you don't actually know what that's like. Right. So I can understand is a great way to validate. Um, if they can validate the emotion, I can understand how that would be scary. That's great. Mm -hmm. If they have trouble with that, it's okay to just say, I can understand why you know, going to school is hard sometimes. Yeah. Just the action. What if they know something's wrong in their child? They, they sense that the child's anxious, but the child isn't necessarily very verbal. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't really know what to validate because the child hasn't really said anything. Yeah. How do you pull that out of a child? I think you name the emotion. So, you know, and you, you're just kind of guessing. You're kind of mm -hmm. being a detective. Like, okay, how would I feel in this moment? I'd feel scared. I'm going to throw it out there. And mm -hmm. the good thing about kids is sometimes they don't know what they're feeling, but they know what they're not feeling. Oh, so good. usually they'll say, no, I wasn't scared. I was sad. Oh. Or I wasn't scared. I was angry or whatever the emotion is. So validating the emotion is the first step. And then really trying to remind them if, let's say, they're, they're fearful about going to school. Mm-hmm. Because um, maybe they've heard some things on the news or it was on social media or they had some sort of exposure to a recent shooting. And for whatever reason, this one hit them hard. Mm -hmm. um, I think the one um, a couple weeks ago in Nashville hit a lot of us hard because a lot of times we feel like Christian schools are small and safe. Yeah. You know, that happens at big public schools. Yeah, but not in a place like that. But not in a place like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a child that might hit them or, you know, they have a connection or you know, something about that feels familiar and to all of us, you know, mm -hmm. it can be that way. And so then what you want to do is just reinforce that they are safe, right? Mm -hmm. There's a difference between possibility and probability, right? So yes, lots of things are possible, but the probability is not super high. Mm -hmm. um, now, I know we have to be careful with that because in this, this yeah. year alone, there's been a lot of shootings, but we want to validate like, yes, something like that could happen, but the probability is pretty low. Mm -hmm. There's lots of, we go to school every day and there has never been a problem the whole time you've been in school. Mm -hmm. 
And then, you know, talking about some of the safety features of the school, you know, that's why you guys do your, your drills. That's why you have a safety officer at your school. That's why, you know, your principal trains the teachers to do this, to kind of reinforce the ways in which their schools or if it's church, church is safe. Yeah. So what you're describing actually is extremely helpful. I can think about even a conversation with my own children. I have, I have two that still live at home. One's 13. The other's almost 15. Um, and just about a week and a half after the shooting in Nashville, uh, my daughter who's in musical theater, there's a performance, they're preparing for, it's tech week, they had to shelter in place. And mm -hmm. it was somebody that wasn't armed, but somebody that was not supposed to be where they were, suddenly finding their way into their school. And she was just undone. Um, mm. I picked her up, and because uh, the, the, the practice ended, picked her up, she was a basket case, understandably, brought her home and then she was just she couldn't go to school the next day you know mm -hmm. all those kinds of things which we really wanted to validate and that wasn't necessarily the word we use uh, or talk about probabilities that's what we were kind of doing but the one who was kind of left in the wake of that was her little brother who's just mm -hmm. a couple years younger he's homeschooled right now going to that school though next year mm -hmm. and he began to have nightmares mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it's like oh he didn't have that experience but He's heard about all the conversations in our house about what happened in Nashville. Then at our own church, you know, the Sunday mm -hmm. after the Nashville shooting, we had a false alarm in the middle of our oh, 11 wow. o'clock service. Unbelievable timing, just, mm -hmm. just horrific in so many ways. It was a false alarm though. It was a mechanical deal that was connected to a, a flood, some water that we had in the building mm -hmm. on Friday. Interestingly, uh, Several people said they heard the announcement that there's an intruder in the building. It's not what it said. It said there's an okay. emergency in the building. But I can easily mm -hmm. understand why that was heard. Mm -hmm. Well, that created trauma for several families, just like, okay, is the church safe now? And, yeah. And yes, it was a false alarm, but can we bring our children here? So when a child has a parent that validates what they're feeling, mm -hmm. talks about probability, I think it's important parents understand that doesn't mean it goes away. In other right. words, this might take multiple yes. conversations or multiple days. So if it's not getting better, mm -hmm. and parents know that it takes time to continue to have those conversations, mm -hmm. what should be things that they're looking, looking at saying, okay, we might yeah. need to get some help here. This isn't getting really better. What I would say is there's kind of like what they call psychological first aid. So if someone is a direct witness to something traumatic, like I saw my little brother drown, mm -hmm. you want to try to get somebody like that help within the first five or six weeks to kind of, there's a lot we can do to kind of like, just like it sounds, first aid kind of hopefully help limit the amount of damage and mm -hmm. impact long-term. So that's important for people to, to know, because I don't think that always is something, you know, you're thinking about. Yeah. Um, if it's more um, like maybe the situation with your son, where mm -hmm. you kind of want to monitor, you know, you want to give it, you may give it eight weeks, 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. If it's not getting any better, and maybe, and it usually gets worse if it's not going to get better. Mm -hmm. You know, it usually mm -hmm. starts to improve. And if it's not, like the symptoms are getting worse, like sleep is really hard, nightmares are bad. Mm -hmm. um, they seem on edge yeah. and irritable all the time. That's increasing, increasing then that's a good time. Sometimes the first person on your stop might be your pediatrician because mm -hmm. they are a good person to go, hey, what's developmentally normal? Yeah. You know, if you happen to have a relationship with a psychologist or a therapist, a, you know, maybe your family has seen mm -hmm. one before in the past and it's good to go back to that person and mm -hmm. go, hey, what do you think? Here's kind of what's going on. But if you don't have that, a pediatrician is a really good person to talk to. Okay, that's really helpful. Yeah. So. We've talked about parents kind of engaging their children on these issues, um, but let's talk about adults. Yes, you know, yes. <laughs> one of the questions, and I'm very grateful for this, that I've gotten a lot over the last few weeks. Um, one has been, we're praying for you. Please let Chad and Jada know we're praying for them. Mm -hmm. But another side has been, how are you? You know, yes. how, And I think it's really important that we are human beings, whether we're you know in ministry, you know, in a practice like you have that's helping mm -hmm. so many people, how do we deal with our own pain? And then how do parents, mm -hmm. when they're actually living in their own fear mm -hmm. over what has taken place, or it's actually scary for them to maybe send their child to school, what are things that, as adults, we can be doing to make sure we're taking care of our own souls? Yes, Mark, that's such a good question, because one of the things we've learned post-COVID pandemic is that if parents aren't doing well, kids are doing a lot worse. Mm. 
So one of the things that we really screen for a lot in our office is how are you doing as a parent with, you know, if something mm -hmm. kind of has happened. Um, and it's really important that adults are making sure they're taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I think there's some things we could call them vices, sin patterns, things that people might go to mm -hmm. when they're in a lot of pain. Alcohol mm -hmm. is yeah. a really good example of that. Mm -hmm. um, it, pornography is a mm -hmm. good example of that. Um, going back to maybe someone has had an eating disorder previously and kind mm -hmm. of engaging in that again. But we all have things we do that are basically poor ways to cope with yeah. our emotions. Something that we feel like, if, at least this will make me happier, bring some com comfort to me, even if I know it's not good. Yeah. But it's just the pattern of our sin that takes us to those places. Yeah, for comfort. I, yeah. I really don't think people are drinking because they're like, I'm happy. Yeah. I think it's really like, there's so much pain and how do I quiet yeah, the yeah. pain? That's well said. Yeah. So that's when we notice we're kind of going into that, you know, during the COVID pandemic, alcohol sales skyrocketed. Yeah. You know, even marijuana mm -hmm. the, for places where it's legal, mm -hmm. that increased a ton. And so when parents are not doing well, again, kids are going to do worse because they need adults that are present and engaged in their lives. And that's super, super important. So I think if you're identifying, I'm getting, we all know, you know, I like laugh. One of my tells is like, if I'm drinking too much Diet Coke and I'm not sleeping. <laughs> that's and that's, like, like, yeah. yeah, and I'm yeah. like, there, there's stress that I'm not dealing really well with. What's too know? much Diet Coke? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I know, I know. And um, so I have to, and it's probably just caffeine is a yeah, better way to put yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> but um, anyway, so I'm, I'm gonna be really watching that if I wake up sometimes when I'm under a lot of stress, if I'm waking up in the middle of the night. So yeah. kind of knowing ourselves to go, what are my, what are my signs? You know, mm -hmm. my spouse, you know, a lot of times we're a mirror Mm -hmm. for them. And so, you know, us gently saying, hey, like I noticed mm -hmm. you've been pouring a drink every night this mm -hmm. week. What's going on? What's up? Yeah. Right. And I think that we can support each other, you know, in our community, um, in our church communities, you know, the relationships of people that we're close to, Yeah. you know, checking in with them. How are you doing with this or that when there's something big that's gone on? So just kind of self-identification and then kind of the people in our lives that we have really close relationships with, if we see their signs. Because a lot of times we're very, very much clued into other people's signs. Yeah, so this is not necessarily related to the topic of trauma, but but I think it's connected. You know, in some communities, it's just a stronghold where people are afraid to really be known, or mm -hmm. they're afraid to admit they've got a problem, mm -hmm. or to reach out to somebody and say, hey, I'm struggling. In a situation like this, where it's not necessarily blatant, uh, you know, but you you know something's not right within. You know, there's just a way you're thinking about things that isn't right, and maybe you are running to things for comfort you shouldn't. But there's a reluctance to come forward and say, "I need help." Mm -hmm. How can we help people? We know in our mm -hmm. church that that is a stronghold that people are just like, mm -hmm. oh, "I'm glad that you guys are seeing a counselor. I'm glad you're meeting with a pastor. I'm glad you're in a small group that's dealing with recovery." But I don't, I don't really have any issues or I don't want to be known as having issues. Mm -hmm. We know that's not true. They know it's not true, but it's still pretty deep. How do we help people come to a place of, it's okay to admit this is having a huge impact on my life or even a small impact, but it's mm -hmm. definitely changing what's normative. I think one of the things that I think you guys are really um, addressing, and I've seen the church address a lot in the past, I think, decade, mm -hmm is um, understanding that it's not, I think sometimes it feels like a spiritual failing if mm -hmm. I need help, help yeah. of any kind. I don't just mean, you know, psychological help, mm -hmm. but any type of help, because if I have my Bible, that should be enough, Yeah. right? And I just, that's not the way that the Lord created things. Mm -hmm. he, he wants us to have other people, right? To bear one another's mm -hmm. burdens. Like we know that that's the case. And I think, Helping people go, hey, it's me, it's you today, it's gonna be me tomorrow. Yeah. Right? And that that kind of humbleness that comes along with like, hey, this is we're all broken. Yeah. We live in a very, very broken world, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need this community. And we and from I think you guys are doing an excellent job of this, but as a church leadership to really go, hey, we're gonna be open, we're gonna be transparent. And I think that trickles down well because mm -hmm. that's what i know about leadership right that mm -hmm. if the leadership is going hey it's okay to ask for help we mm -hmm. all need help that really helps that mm -hmm. and to just go i think sometimes as believers you know we want to be um 
we want to be perfect sometimes mm -hmm. in some ways. We want to be perfect Christians. We want to be good parents. Mm -hmm. We want to be good friends. We want to have a good marriage. And it's hard to kind of let people in when we go, this is kind of my yuck. Yeah. I was in a meeting this week and having a tough discussion. And um, I was really kind of a little embarrassed that one of my partners was present. It's a newer partner in my mm -hmm. practice. And I was like, oh, I really don't want him to see this side of me yet. Yeah. And then I thought, well, that's that's not really okay. This is why we're partners is so that we can go through these tough things together. So I love that you shared that because yeah. that's normal. You know, yes. I, I wrestle with the same things. It's like, I don't want weakness or, or you know, things that I don't want others to see exposed, uh, which in itself is you know, not, not good. It's not yeah. healthy because that's not what I want them to do. Um, but it is deep in us, right? Mm -hmm. And I think about as it relates to trauma, how if you're really afraid, you know, mm -hmm. um, or you're not certain, uh, it'd be so easy to think, well, then I lack faith. And mm -hmm. because I lack faith, I don't want them to be seen, so I'm gonna pretend I don't, yet I'm really struggling. I am waking up in the middle of the night, yeah. I am having these thoughts. And you know, our enemy doesn't want us to acknowledge that. He doesn't want us to bring that into the light. As kind of the difference would be, no, mm -hmm. bring that out, just be honest. Yeah, and I think a lot of times in trauma, especially if people have had multiple traumas, it's hard to trust others because mm -hmm. maybe their trauma had to do with an adult not acting in a way yeah. that an adult should act, or maybe it was a, you know, someone that they were married to that they were acting in a way that doing things that should never be done in a marriage. So I think that also with trauma, a lot of times there's been these breaks in trust. Yeah, and so then that makes it even harder to reach out and ask for help. What are some ways that we could break trust, not even knowing we're doing it? In other words, this is kind of back to the validation mm -hmm. point at the beginning. Um, I talked recently to, um, in a counseling situation, a younger uh, member of our church uh, with her parents, mm -hmm. and she'd gone through a really, really hard time. And I just, she's older now, but the mm -hmm. hard time was you know, several years ago. And I asked her, what would you like to say to your nine-year-old self? Mm -hmm. And her response was pretty amazing. She mm -hmm. said, I believe you. Mm. I, I knew that was big. Um, yeah, I believe big. you. So I, I think we went a little deeper with that, and she's like, my teachers didn't believe me. Mm -hmm. My siblings didn't believe me. My parents believed me, which was, I think, genuine, Good. and they were there. Yeah. But her peers didn't believe her, and she had been living with that a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what are, what are things that we could do or say, mm -hmm. even if we're not trying to communicate um, or break a, you know, a trust there that we need to be, really be careful of? I think sometimes um, when, when let's, let's use a, a child and parent mm -hmm. relationship here, you know, if a child bring, brings forth something like this has happened to me or been happening to me, mm -hmm. um, for the parent to go, oh, well, there's no way, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So right, because dismisses it. Dismisses it because there's there usually when people bring stuff to their parents' attention, it's pretty serious that they would even go there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one way. Another thing is, you know, we as adults are mandatory reporters of abuse, mm -hmm. and so one of the things we can always mention to people, um, I mention is probably not the right way. We can explicitly state is that, hey, there may be some things that you share that I might have to tell somebody else mm -hmm. in order to keep you safe or in order to keep other mm -hmm. kids and teens safe. Mm -hmm. So to let them know that, so if a person's been through trauma, they feel like their life has been out of control. Yeah. And so providing them with that control of whether or not they wanna share what they wanna share with oh, you. Actually it helps. Actually helps, mm -hmm. it's really helpful. And then most of the time, if they have even come to you in that manner, they want to share. They yeah. want, they've wanted to tell someone, they've wanted to tell an adult. Yeah. So just not saying, hey, I'm not going to tell anyone when you may really, that may be absolutely the right thing to do right. or you have to. Right, yes. right. But that's extremely helpful. And I think being consistent, um, consistently checking in on them, being a consistent place for them because relationships, um, one of the amazing things I think about the way God designed them is that's where healing a lot of times takes place. Yeah. But to do that, you have to be a really consistent person. So for example, if I'm working with a kid that's been through trauma, I really try to alert them if our appointment time is going to change, mm -hmm. you know, to let them know what to expect. Because almost anything that's unpredictable could kind of be another layer of distrust yes. or lack of control, which scares them even more. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. And it doesn't make it a consistently safe place to 
to share and to get help and to get treatment. That's insightful because even parents, you know, given the world that we live in and yes. the chaos of schedules and stuff, we are probably often making adjustments to things in a way that we don't realize might really not yes. be helpful to our children in ways we couldn't have imagined. Yes, because they kids really like, and teenagers, um, as much as they may push back at times on this, they really like structure and routines and knowing what to expect, especially kids. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important if kids have been through a lot that we go back to those structure, those routines, those things that feel normal. Mm -hmm. And that's why going to school is so important. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk a lot about that in our office. Like, we need to get you back in school because that's what is normal. That's where you should be. That's what you should be doing kind mm -hmm. of thing. So let's talk about that specifically because that's going to be kind of the, you know, the heart of it really of many parents being like, okay, my child doesn't want to go to school now or feels mm -hmm. like he can't go to school now. So how do I think about that? What's too much? I know when one of our children went through a tough time, I, I remember going through carpool line and it was just gut-wrenching because mm -hmm. she was crying and I wasn't literally putting my foot on her to push her out the door. But practically. But practically, <laughs> the door was open, the school knew, they were great. They're kind of lifting her up and here mm -hmm. we go and she would settle down. But I would walk or drive away just weeping because yes. I knew it was hard. And that actually created honestly some trauma about yeah. you know what is this morning going to be like how many mornings are going to be like this so what are some practical things that you can tell parents in those kind of moments well i think sometimes when their child is having a lot of distress the idea can be that oh what i'm doing is the wrong thing mm. you know because we're trained as parents at a young age you know babies cry and then yeah. we do things to help them calm down and yeah. so we can kind of get in this pattern of oh they're having distress that means i need to do something or not do something mm -hmm. to help them feel better mm -hmm. and so one of the things is it's really hard for kids if they stop going to school to mm -hmm. get back to school and every day they're out of school there builds a lot of anxiety about getting back and this can be because of trauma not related to school. This yeah. can be because of anxiety, lots of reasons. But the best thing to do is to do what you did mm -hmm. and help them get to school. And you know, talk to somebody at school and go, wow, they're really having a hard time. What can we do to help them? You know, mm -hmm. They're in high school, maybe they've missed a lot of school and they need somebody there to help them manage, how do I get all this work turned in? Mm -hmm. How do I do that? All the things that I've missed because I went to the funeral or right. lots of things they've done. In the younger grades, it might just be actually getting there. Mm -hmm. And then that's talking to somebody at school, a school counselor mm -hmm. or somebody on staff to go, hey, it's going to be really hard to get them out of the car. Can yeah. you help me get them out of the car in the mm -hmm. morning? So trying to have a little bit of a plan. Mm -hmm. And even if they can't go back a full day, trying to just start back slowly mm -hmm. to build back into that full schedule is really important. I think this is such an important conversation because... A lot of times parents look like they're the only ones in carpool line that are dealing with something like that. And we know that's not true. Right. If, if there aren't a slew of others, there will be mm -hmm. one day and you might be able to help them. But one of the benefits we had is we didn't have that idea. It wasn't like we were just great parents and knew what to do. One of your colleagues gave us the advice you're giving now. It's like mm -hmm. she really needs to get to school. Mm -hmm. And it was gut-wrenching, but having that assurance from another voice that's giving yes. us counsel was really significant. And then getting the school on the same page, mm -hmm. um, which was easy. They were like, mm -hmm. of course, this isn't the first time we've dealt with this. You're not the only child we're doing this with right. today. But you can feel so isolated. You yes. can feel like we're the only ones going through this. And Absolutely. it's just not true. So not that, at all. Not at all. And then, you know, I wanted to mention this. Um, I think it's sometimes we think about kids not really being able to address the trauma until they're older. Sometimes mm -hmm. I hear that from parents. And we actually have a great trauma treatment, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy for kids and adolescents. And one of the things that I love about it is it teaches, it starts off slow, teaches kids how to cope with mm -hmm. strong feelings, helps them look at their thoughts, but it helps them write a story, a narrative. Mm -hmm. And then we get to correct parts of that narrative that aren't correct. Because when trauma happens in kids, you know, developmentally, they're so egocentric, mm -hmm. um, which is right where they're supposed to be. Right. But they think um, things revolve around them. So if something bad happens, then they think, I caused that. Yeah, I did that. Fault. I mm -hmm. did that. And so I was working with a kiddo who his brother drowned in a pool. It was horrible. Mm -hmm. And his brother had special needs. So it was just a really sad situation mm -hmm. for him and for that family. Mm -hmm. And when he wrote out what he thought happened, he really thought that he must have left a gate open. Uh, or in some fault. way, it was mm -hmm. his fault that this happened to his brother. So essentially, he told me, well, I killed my brother. Yeah. Well, if you can imagine walking around thinking you killed your brother. Yeah. 
that's horrible. And it what it just wasn't the case, but that's what happens in kids and teens when traumatic things happen. And when something like, you know, a horrific event happens and a seed is planted in the mind of a child um, that this took place, if it's really bad, they're probably not going to come out and say it. They so, don't even know it sometimes. So, and so they're living in that. And it's not yes. something that, they, that just pops up occasionally. It's kind of the air they're breathing. Yes. And the longer that goes on, the more stress, anxiety, fear, et cetera, begins mm -hmm. to just build upon their little souls. Yes, and it impacts their relationships they have with other people because if they think they killed someone, then obviously that's going to change how they interact with their friends, right? Mm -hmm. That changes how well they can do academically in school, which mm -hmm. it's not about getting perfect grades, but you want kids to be generally successful in school and with friends and their, their outside extracurricular activities because that's what helps them gain a sense of confidence. Yeah, And so it can really get them off their developmental course, which is what I try to help parents understand is, hey, we really want them to stay on that developmental course. That's why we do these interventions. It's why you get eyeglasses for them. Same thing. Yeah. Same idea. And I think that's important. I know that's changed a lot, which is good, the kind of stigma around counseling and things yes. like that. I love how it's changed. And our own daughter, you know, meets with one of your colleagues regularly, and she is an amazing gift to our family. Um, but she wasn't ready for it, you know, when she first probably needed it, and then not long after she was. And I asked her, and she was probably at that point, maybe in sixth grade, mm -hmm. uh, I said, what's the difference? And she goes, oh, well, counseling's cool. <laughs> so she said, I said, okay, what do, what do you mean by that? She's like, everybody goes to counseling. And I was like, well, that's good, isn't it? She goes, well, it is good. It's helping me. And so I love that the, the stigma has kind of begun to move away. But the way you described it, I don't think most parents have probably thought of it that way, is you're helping them write their story. Mm -hmm. And that's that's so centered on what the Word of God is about. Mm -hmm. It's the story of the history of redemption from Genesis to Revelation. And then the Lord enters in as He sent, and He rescues us, right? Mm -hmm. And from all sorts of things, ultimately sin. But the dynamic of how a child could learn to write their story at a young age, particularly if something has been done to them or something's just not working right, I think that's really beautiful. I think it's such a powerful way to describe part of what's taking place in mm. therapy. Oh, I love it because we know as adults, we have these, what we call these beliefs mm -hmm. about ourselves. And um, a lot of them aren't good, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. they're based on experiences. They're based on these, maybe these moments. And as parents, this is really humbling, saying this to myself too, but you may not enter in and have the right words in a situation that may have really a negative impact on yeah. them. And then this is a way for them to kind of understand, you know, because we're even able to say, well, do you think, was your mom, was your mom kind of stressed when she said that? Mm. Yeah, you know, she was trying to make dinner and do homework with my brother and okay, you know, and just helping them see kind of the picture that they can't see as a child, right? Yeah. Or as an adolescent. So that's really important. And I too love that the stigma has been brought down because I think emotional health is so important and mm -hmm. it's as important as medical health. And we would never say, oh, we're not going to take them to the pediatrician when right. they get sick. And I think for this, a lot of the stuff that we're teaching them is just tools that it, it's good for life, right? Yeah. I think I tell my husband over and over again, I was like, man, as an adult, I think you got to be really good at coping with stress because we just, in the world we live in, we just have so much stress in our yeah, lives. It's just in the air we breathe. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. yeah. It's so true. Well, you've been so kind to give us time. And I would love to continue this conversation at another time, maybe on other subjects, uh, because you have such a clear way of expressing kind of what's going on in the heart and mind and how we can come alongside each other and help. Is there anything you wanted to say that we didn't talk about today as it relates to trauma or anything? Yes. Can I just say one thing, Mark? Sure, and that'll be course. my final thing. I think sometimes parents are a little, uh, Christian parents especially, because mm -hmm. they care so much about their, their family and their role as a parent. Yeah. I'm not saying more than unbelievers, but just they see it as like part of their biblical charge. Yeah, they're calling. They're calling. I find that sometimes they can think bringing their child to therapy is a failure on their yeah. own, a failure of maybe teaching, instructing, protecting, whatever it is. And I just want them to know it is absolutely not a failure at all. Yeah. That that this is, it's addressing an issue just like if they were having trouble in math, you get them a math tutor in five seconds. They need glasses, you get them glasses. Yeah. They need yeah. help managing, learning how to cope with their emotions. We got to do that, even if it's not trauma. It's really important. And so to just take that stigma away, that good parents just get their kids what they need. Yeah. I love that we're ending on that. 
you know, and for anybody listening, I've got five children. I know two have been in counseling. Uh, I would guess at some point in their life, the other three will as well. And we want to do everything we can to support that. You know, they needed it. It was the dynamic of their life, what they were going through. And in every case, they brought perspective. The counselors brought perspective to them that we just didn't have. Mm-hmm. And in, because of that, the tools that we were then given to think about our own life and our own souls and my wife and I to talk about different things has been huge, mm-hmm. such a benefit. And it's just, it, we can't say it enough. You know, the means of grace that God has given us, he's given us his word, he's given us prayer, he's given us sacraments, he's also given us fellowship, you know, don't give up meeting as someone in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you say the day approaching. Well, that extends to people who have been given specific gifts to understand what might be going on in the hearts and minds and and even in the chemical makeup of an individual physically that can really impact their life. And to be in a place where you can help Ask somebody to help you understand how to write your story, help you connect dots on things, I think is so important. And it's not failure. Um, And I don't want to create any shame here, but the failure would be to not do it. That's Mm -hmm. what the failure would be. It's like Mm -hmm. if I know my child needed glasses and I refused to take them to the eye doctor because I felt like I'd be a parent failing if they can't see, that would be foolish. Mm-hmm. The failure would be, yeah. I'm not going to let you go because it would expose you to something weak about us. Does that make sense? Yes, totally. That yeah. And it is the way I see a, see this as yeah. well. So I yeah. just think it's really important and um, the best thing to do is address it and address it sooner rather than later. Sometimes the longer these things go on, kids get more and more off that developmental curve. Yeah. And then unfortunately, our world offers solutions like drugs and alcohol and sex and things that um, are not good solutions to these yeah. issues. And they will lead to destruction one way or the other. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I want to say it one more time. We need it, period. As mm-hmm. a mom, as a dad, and then as siblings, we, as a family, we need it. And we've seen the benefit of it. And the blessing is even now, uh, because, you know, our, our youngest daughter, as she's moved through different things, she knows when she needs it. She'll mm-hmm. be like, hey, when's my next appointment? I would really love to go sooner if I can um, because she knows the benefit of what it's going to be like to have somebody say, well, here's what it sounds like to me. Is that true? And it's it's life-changing. And I guess that's the message I want to leave with. It's life-changing. It's transformational. So anyway, I'm grateful for you, for the calling that you've been given, for, for Sparrow House, just the wonderful counselors that are there. I'm very, very grateful personally as well as a pastor. So this has been very helpful and insightful. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Thank you for watching or listening. Uh, You're not alone. And I hope you can tell that even in the way we talk today. There are so many things that come against us um, in this world. Um, It can be very dark at times, very lonely. No matter where you are in your journey, the best thing you can do is reach out to somebody, um, ultimately reaching out to the Lord. Um, It is not failure to say you need help. Um, An old theologian, old, old theologian from the early 20s used to say, helplessness is our best prayer. And what that meant is we're going to cry out. We recognize now that we cannot do it on our own. So don't do it on your own. You can reach out to us at deeplight at pcpc.org or call us at 214-224-2500. We'll also have in the show notes connections to the information for Sparrow House, which is one of the places where you could look for help. We're so grateful for you. And again, thank you. Thanks, Appreciate Mark. it. Uh, God bless. Thank you for listening to the Deep Light Podcast from Park City's Presbyterian Church. We would love for you to be our guest this Sunday morning as we gather together for worship at 8, 9.30, or 11 a.m. We are located in the Uptown Dallas area at the corner of Oaklawn Avenue and Wycliffe Avenue. To find out more, please visit pcpc.org.